for the third demo, I was going to um, now show you how our overlays can actually connect to non-Silver Peak entities. So in this case, we've uh, chosen to use Zscaler as a firewall as a service. We um, um, essentially on this LA site, I've uh, set up a policy where my um, uh, internet traffic will get forwarded to to, uh, to Zscaler. So let me. Uh, just do a few web web requests here, and then we'll log into the Zscaler portal. Just generate some random. And uh, let's see what happens. So this usually times out, so I'll just need to find the login page again. So we have many customers that deploy with on-site firewalls, um, but we are finding that there's, as more and more traffic is internet bound, that there's, there's a fairly large interest in, uh, in using a service like, like Zscaler as firewall as a service. So we thought if we make this really seamless and easy to integrate with the uh, Edge Connect solution, then that speeds up people being able to, to deliver security to the sites. So, password. I think. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, by no means an, an, an expert on, on, on Zscaler, but essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna go look at some of the logs and um, uh, there's sort of a way to to filter this down to to the last to the last few minutes. Uh, so essentially, um, maybe this is even too much. Right. So can you give the high level on Zscaler? Sort of. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So sure. So so Zscaler is firewall as a service. So think of. Your, customer, your users are going off to some site, God knows where, and you want to permit some things and you want to forbid other things, but you definitely want to log whatever is happening. And so Zscaler is basically your firewall that you used to own on-prem. They're managing it and it's doing a full state, full inspection. And so that's what we're, what we're connecting it to. Thank you. And so basically we generated a bunch of requests, right? So I went to Google, I went to Facebook, I went to LinkedIn, um, I went to, I thought I went to Twitter at the end. So it sometimes takes a couple of seconds to, uh, to register. Um, and so we've essentially mapped the HTTP traffic on that appliance and we're sending that on to Zscaler using um, a rule that we basically inserted here, right? That's so what, overlay too. That's essentially it's so the the Zscaler uh, component because it goes to a certain IP address. So Zscaler will provide you with pops. So I think they have about fifty across the U.S. And so the mapping of which pop to which physical site today is something that you need to do based on the IP address that they gave you. Uh, looking in the next release to automate that through their API, where you could say, connect me to the closest one, and where we bring you some, you know, some of the benefits that we do with the SaaS egress gateway that um, optimization that John was asking about. Uh, but today, you'd have to go through that list and decide, this is, this is the site I want to go to. The key part, though, is I can add uh, another one of these roles. So there's, um, uh, you can essentially add one, a second one of these tunnels, and then I can have a route policy that load balances. So what a lot of customers do is, if they have two ISPs, choose two different Zscaler pops. And so not only do you get load balancing redundancy between the ISPs, but also if one of their pops became, became unavailable. So the same the same load balancing concepts apply for that. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's all I had for the the demos. I think we have a we have a few more minutes if if uh, you know there's specific areas you want to see or uh, questions you know like that. The, um, the bombing policy stuff was particularly interesting to me. But is there so if that's applied at the business intent level, that's mm -hmm. per overlay then, right? 
Yes, so the bonding, actually, let's quickly maybe what go I'm back to, like, to one of these you screens. you had some devices that were having internet connectivity issues and you wanted to change that policy to make them more performant, but you didn't want to impact the entire overlay for all of your devices, is that possible? Uh, yeah, so, so you didn't want to impact the... So like if it's per overlay, right? Oh, if it's per overlay, oh, I, see, I see what you mean. Yeah. So you can, you can cross-connect the providers. So some, if you have a mix of sites and uh -huh. some of the sites may need to fail over to, you know, let's say your MPLS goes out and you're failing over to LT. That does not mean that your entire network needs to fail over to LT. Right. So you can do on, on, on just a, on, that, on that link, essentially have that failover. But maybe, maybe I didn't I think, understand yeah, I got, the question. I, understand, I, think I, I think if I understand <coughs> the question, it's can you override the overlay policy? Mm -hmm. And so we do let you do that. You can go in to an appliance and um, make specific changes that, overla that override the overlay, but that's not really the way, it, it, not the way an SD-WANs normally meant to work. To make, otherwise, you will end up with snowflakes. Yeah. And so we are actually um, you know, exploring different ways to uh, constrain that capability. So today, we've erred on the side of allowing people to go in and make per site overrides, um, but we are um, contemplating having the ability to, to lock things down, to stop, to make that something that we, where it's clearly you're making an exception. Um, we ha do have the ability to track where that's happening, where there's a discrepancy. Um, and we can also set it up so the overlay manager will, will uh, heal that and, and take the, you could go in and do that and would put it back. Um, but th that's you know, one of those things where I think SD-WAN, you want to make it simple because you want that overlay screen that we've been sitting on. There's one of those for each service for the whole network. And then you never have to go and do anything per site or per appliance. If you go down the override path, you're kind of trading back towards where networking is today. So that's a, I think for everybody, not just Silver Peak, but for everybody looking at SD-WAN, that's a um, an kind of interesting thing, an interesting question of, um, do you allow do you allow those those uh, override configurations and how do you control them? So at a higher level, though, like let's say we had one overlay, but we had a mix of these units that were using different connectivity, right? And some of them yep. were just using internet, and mm -hmm. some had MPLS or LTE or something. Would the recommendation then be to have separate overlays so you could have separate policies, even though you, you see what I'm getting at? Like if you oh, okay, oh, I, no, see so what I mean. think no, okay. it's got it's. So now your question is okay. more like his, okay. his original question okay. in that. When you're checking these um, primary and backup, it's, if that doesn't exist at that site, it's obviously unchecked. Mm -hmm. And so that is like where, where Rolf said, the cross-connect providers is important. So say some sites have MPLS and internet, some sites have internet and LTE, and some sites have MPLS and LTE. And so when you don't just want to have MPLS to MPLS tunnel and an internet to internet tunnel, and an LTE to LTE tunnel. You need LTE to MPLS, LTE to internet, internet to MPLS. That's what cross-connect providers is. So that, that's one of the things people really gloss over, and, and we did today. Um, in terms of a simple demonstration, it looks like, oh, there's an MPLS tunnel and an internet tunnel. In reality, when you've got a complicated network with multiple different types of technology, you want to be able to have those cross-connect paths as well. And so that's exactly what that checkbox does and it also means that even if all your sites at LTE, if one of the sites LTE is your backup, so you switch to LTE, you don't suddenly want to be pumping LTE traffic to every other location when their default MPLS or, Com or their Comcast cable connections up. And so we we won't use LTE at any site unless if, if LTE is a backup, unless that particular site's um, got the other alternatives down. Does that so, make sense? Yes. So how does that cross-connect work then? Um, is it, is it so, routing to sorry about that. other nodes somewhere else in the network? It's, and then it's probably easier on the whiteboard, but it's creating a mesh uh, between the different um, transport types. So if you have MPLS on the internet, <coughs> and if you didn't do cross-provider mm -hmm. uh, connections, you would have MPLS to MPLS, internet to inter internet. With yeah, this, you're getting the, the... Well, where did the packets actually make the jump from one transport to the other transport? So that depends on the, like, that depends on the peering. So say you've got Comcast cable and Verizon LTE. So 
the, the, the Verizon LTE, presumably the LTE to LTE path stays on Verizon's backbone. And the Comcast one, I'm not quite sure where it goes, but you could do the BGP trace route to find out. So it's going from Comcast to Comcast. Then the Comcast to Verizon is going to start on Comcast. And then based on what's going on with BGP on the day, it's going to traverse across to the Verizon network at some peering point. But that's going to change day by day and potentially so, hour by hour. But we're tracking, measuring exactly what's happening on all of those paths. And there's actually, you know, the, the normal case we are thinking about those cross-connect paths is when there's a failure. But okay, I think you answered the question in that <coughs> that jump happens in the internet. In the internet, yes. It does not happen Which, at another Silver Peak box. No. That happens to be connected to both sides. Well, then okay. what about the private MPLS circuit? So that MPLS to internet circuit. Yeah. And I think that was, that I thought was where you were yeah. originally driving is, okay, <laughs> I have something I can't talk to on the internet, talk to something on the internet, somebody's peering. Yeah. Some, somebody's acting as the cross-connect somewhere. Yeah. So when, when you've got an internet to MPLS uh -huh. cross-connect, that traffic's going to go through the enterprise's um, MPLS to internet gateways. So depending on how they've set up their MPLS network, they may only have a couple of gateways. They may be using a service provider's service to provide multiple gateways. Um, typically, that connectivity is going to be more constrained than the connectivity between two ISPs. Um, right. So the cross-connect providers is most useful when you're looking at uh, multiple forms of internet connectivity. Okay. Right. Does, do you define the gateways? I mean, so you said it's either a service or is it within Silverpeak? You say, oh, you know, when we cross MPLS to internet, I only want to do it at site A, B, and C, but not at site D? Or do you not have control over that? Um, we leave that to the um, that policy to how the cust the customer is setting up their their MPLS network. So we're not trying to influence or constrain what they do. Okay, I'm I'm just trying to. Uh, I have site A, which is a yep. MPLS primary site. Mm -hmm. That's how I want my traffic going. Yeah, it's interacting <coughs> with another branch location. That's an internet only site. Yeah, it has to transit somewhere. Yeah, is it tra tra transit at the hub? Does it transit, do I take the internet path because it's the most available and easiest to go even though I say MPLS is preferred? Like, I mean, I'm try just trying to figure out how you set those policies because if it takes MPLS, then at the hub, I'm assuming. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. since that other site is not an MPLS connected um, site, we would have to, I mean, you have to, you have to transit somewhere and I guess yeah. same, so, uh, same guys problem. Yeah, I'm trying so, to understand where that yeah. is I, and what controls you have over where that is so that you're not doing the transit at a branch site. Yeah, so I think it's probably the easiest way to, to kind of answer the question is to clarify that our system is an edge to edge system. So all, all of the devices are meshed, but it's an overlay and there's no, it's one, one hop away, we're one hop away from everything, so we don't have transit things in the center that are part, um, that, that are kind of in the way. Um, so, the, the <laughs> I mean, like asking how. Is, so, lo yeah. lo how logically, <laughs> logically, we agree. I understand agree. what you're saying. The but carrier, right? Isn't the carrier, the carrier is providing an MPLS internet gateway and you're leveraging that, right? Yes. The underlay, the yeah. transport, yes, the, the transport. Carrier is so, the, and that internet gateway, if it's by private MPLS, should be IPsec tunnel, right? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be straight to the internet. I, I, it's my private MPLS network. I, yeah, not that, necessarily my internet it, access. Usually an MPLS so, network is closed. It's not right, open right. to the internet. Well, so there is I no... Think, I think what he's saying is if you yeah. have an MPLS and an ISP network, however you normally route between those two is the path it takes, right? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's right. why right. cross-connect yeah. providers... The underlay. Un, it's, the, it's just un routed on by transport. By default, because most people think about their MPLS network and the internet network being completely separate. But then when you get into real life and you start looking at things like LTE, you realize that, oh, it doesn't make sense through MPLS to MPLS, internet to internet, and LTE to LTE. Because now if one site fails to LTE, all the traffic to all other sites, even though the MPLS is working fine, is now coming on LTE and you're paying by the byte. And so mm -hmm. it's really, it's not so much the MPLS use case, that's why it's kind of checked off, because most people are looking at MPLS and, say, cable. But once you start going out and looking at dual broadband, or broadband and LTE, that's when, this, that's when this thing becomes actually pretty important. And I, I don't know of anybody else that's actually uh, doing this. It's one of the things I think that's unique. And you certainly need to be able to handle 
a lot of tunnels because not only are you meshing the sites, you're meshing all the possible paths that exist between your broadband providers and choosing the best one at any particular point in time. I have a more general question. Uh, is it possible, for example, in my headquarter, I want not only one box, I want two boxes because I don't want a single point of failure. Yes. For example, I have four ISP uplinks. How do you handle it with a Silver Peak solution uh, with multiple boxes? Yes, so we uh, uh, obviously allow the high availability um, deployments. We use on the internal, you'll use VRP, right? So you point with one virtual IP address to the one or the other that is, that is the active one. And then you drive traffic to it either via PBR, WCCP, or um, even static routing, and as Damon mentioned, dynamic routing uh, very shortly. So multiple multiple edge connects, one hub, for example, or dual you know, edge routers cross-connect them, right? So you have full redundancy on the edge router, and they can access one edge connect or edge connect B. And then from the servers, let's say it's a data center, the servers within will use the VIP for VRP to point to the okay. edge connect. Is that possible with all hardware boxes or only with the bigger ones? No, that's possible with all, 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 all systems. So in fact, a lot of one of the things that we really wanted to push with the model was that even some of the speed, some of the speeds and feeds are a little bit different and the form factor is different. We didn't want the capabilities to differ, whether you're on a VM or on what we call the ECXL, the, the, the largest edge connect. And because of the fact that all of these systems use, can do line rate IPsec encryption because they support the AES and I instruction set, uh, we have a very consistent, the flow scaling is the same from the smallest box to the, the, lar the largest system. So you don't get into these kind of complexities of, you know, yeah. Which which unit do I choose? So literally, the matrix that Damon showed in terms of the positioning, you know, your small branch up to 200 megabits per second this is probably your good bet. It can do 50 megabits per second of boost if you want to. But outside of that, the matrix is very very simple, right? So there's no no fine print underneath. Great, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's the the, the model. So yeah. I heard I heard that there's multiple deployments where you can be in a bridge mode, WCCP, and I think I heard that routing protocols are coming? Yeah, so, so at the edge of the SD1 fabric, yeah. within the SD1 world, right, bubble, we use measure, our real-time measurements of loss, latency, and jitter to find the ideal tunnel to jump on to get to the other side, right? So that's what I think, Greg, you've called that one, one hop routing. At the edge, um, what we're adding is BGP and OSPF in terms of being able to redirect traffic from the edge router more dynamically. If we're serving an overlay for a certain subnet, we can advertise that as opposed to you having to go sort of configure PBR or WCCP. So that's, that's okay. where the routing comes out. But I just want to clarify, not within, not within the SD1 fabric itself. We have our Okay. Better way of doing yeah. it. Okay. So, so, so yeah, our the the way we see um, the <coughs> routing the routing protocols let us interface more dynamically mm -hmm. between the SD WAN environment, which is ex extremely dynamic, and the external world. To build the tunnels. To, to not to build the tunnels because the tu them. it's just um, l imagine um, you um, have an SD WAN and you're adding branches to it and. When one of the features we have is that when you add a branch, we'll automatically provision the um, subnets for that branch. So imagine it's a green field and you say 10 slash um, 8 is going to be for my DHCP servers, or maybe I'm going to go 10.0 slash 16. I want to use that to allocate um, chunks of 256 IPs to my branches as they come up. And so we'll automatically manage the allocation of those IP addresses as you add a branch. So add branch, add a branch, add a branch. At the data center sites, we want to be able to advertise with BGP or OSPF as those sites are added that there's now reachability to those subnets. So the SD-WAN automatically learns about those branches. Our device at the head end knows that. We want to be able to advertise that at um, a subnet, the individual subnet granularity versus what we do today, which is a static aggregate. Okay, so, go on, so then 
I'm going back to just standing up a Silver Peak box at a branch that has LTE, MPLS, and internet. You, before you build those tunnels, you've got to have routes mm -hmm. to your different sites. Mm -hmm. Are those static routes? Uh, no, no, those are, that's all dynamic one hop routing. So between when we set up the IP6 tunnel, the orchestrator sets up the tunnel, mm -hmm. and then over that we are distributing um, routes with a very efficient proprietary one hop routing protocol. How do you know how to set up the tunnel the, to, to a certain destination? You know so what I'm saying? the orchestrator knows that. So when, when a device comes online, it goes to the portal and it's discovered by the orchestrator. The, the orchestrator now has a way of managing that appliance and it can find out the private IPs and the public IPs of all the WAN interfaces. So it knows all the endpoints for each site okay. and then it can go through and set up the IPsec tunnels. Okay. Like that. Presumably so, because you're publishing locally significant data as you register these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So say, connect this A to B, mm -hmm. and whatever those resolve to, make that tunnel. Yeah. Because right. what, what I was getting at with that is that cross-connect providers, yeah. when you check that off, I don't have to go in and start messing with routes or anything. No. It's all going to build that for me. No, it's all, it's all automatic. The whole goal is that you... You never need to go to one of our elements, and you shouldn't have to go to anybody else's yeah. element, provided your underlay is working. Like, sometimes people talk about SD-WAN replacing MPLS, and that, or, but that's, as I said at the beginning, a little bit misleading because SD-WAN is an overlay, and it needs something underneath. It could be MPLS, it could be the Internet, but the, the OSPF and BGP that are used in, the, in providing your MPLS IP VPN or your Internet those are really important because they're getting the way to get the packets across the network. Mm -hmm. But what you don't need to do as an enterprise is import <coughs> that complexity into connecting users to apps. You can build this overlay that, that lets you abstract all that away and do this measurement-based routing. And that's kind of, in essence, yeah. um, how I see SD-WAN. Everyone has a little bit of a different viewpoint, but mm -hmm. that's our view of what SD-WAN is all about. Okay. So presumably you're running IGPs on the LAN sides to integrate with what's local. Yeah, that's that's part of this. The other, there's two cases to think about for the routing. One is what I talked about at the head end, which I think is the more important case. Um, the other is in in a larger branch. So in a small branch, with and we're in router mode, we're typically direct connected or VLAN connected to all of the subtending subnets, so we know about them because they're direct. Um, in a complicated um, location, like say a regional headquarters, there may be tens of subnets in that location, mm -hmm. and yes, by um, doing OSPF inside there, we could learn those um, automatically. Uh, on the WAN side, are we kind of relying on default routes, or are we doing BGP, or are we doing OSPF, or so, again, just between the different technologies, I mean, if it's a cable modem or something, fine, you're going to get DHCP and get an address. If it's an MPLS private WAN circuit, okay, there's going to be some kind of customer yep. edge router, but we need to get those routes dynamically, presumably. So, so, so we can do everything from um, a, a DHCP address coming from a Comcast cable modem to emulating the CE capability peering with a um, MPLS IPVPN. And cool. so we can do anything in, within that spectrum, and that's... Basically, we want to be able to, all the classic ways of connecting up a WAN, we want to be able to support on our WAN side. Okay. Did you guys ask about REST API yet? I'm, I'm surprised that, I'm looking at you two. <laughs> <laughs> no REST API question? You two, not me too. Yeah, no, these two, Jason, Jason and Matt, no. Okay, normally there's a, does it have a REST API question? Does it have a REST yes. API? Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. So REST is, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, first, better. REST is our, um, is a first class citizen in our, in our architecture. So the orchestrator talks to the elements with REST. Everything's available um, um, with uh, it, all the functionality is exposed in REST, both on the element and, and the orchestrator. And it's not a bolt-on. It's what we actually use to do all of this. So... Um, yes, there's, there's a CLI um, there as well, but that's not what we're doing. We don't, we don't do SSH with CLI going backwards and forwards. Everything. So you have a, an HTTP server rest. running on every uh, router, effectively, mm -hmm. and you connect that way. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. What do we clear? You know, is it rest to the orchestrator or rest also to every device? Rest to every device and, and okay. to the orchestrator. Okay, cool.